Ricky Romero, former Blue Jays All-Star guy who's pitched, uh, yeah, home opener, uh, opening day. What's up, brother? How are we doing? Good, man. How are you? I'm doing all right. Uh, okay, so let me start with this. Is it is it better or worse starting on the road or home in terms of, like, the pressure that comes with a, a season? Like, which one did you enjoy more? Like, coming home to pitch oh. or starting on the oh, road heck. and pitching? No, nah, man. It's, uh, at home, for yeah. sure. It, okay. was, it, it was always at home. And I only, I mean, I only did two, right? I, yeah. I did, I did, uh, in 2011, I did, we did the home opener, um, right off, right off of spring training. And yeah. then the next, the next year it was, we started in Cleveland Yeah, and for, I, and I feel like for the guys this year, I mean, it's, it's, it's tough, right? I mean, when you go from spring training, uh, where you pretty much you're on the road, I mean, you're at home, but it's still the road for mm-hmm. a lot of the guys and you're still not really settled anywhere you know you're you're going to be in spring training for four or five weeks, and then you're you're off, and then you start on the road for nine straight games. <laughs> it doesn't make it easy, mm-hmm. um, but um, but I'm sure you know. Obviously, for me, knowing that we were coming home, and that you get to get settled, you get your place, you get. I didn't have a family at the time, but I know the guys that had families there. They can get their family settled, and they find their apartments, and everyone's moving in, and and you kind of just feel like, all right, this is home for the next. X amount of months, and and there was something always about that, and obviously, you know, opening day itself uh, speaks for itself, especially in the city of Toronto. I mean, mm-hmm. I've always said this. Um, I tell my guys here in LA, uh, a lot of friends that I have, I'm like, you know, you guys talk about Dodger Stadium opening day and this and that, but I'm, honestly, you guys have to experience one one in Toronto. There's just something special about it. It's just different, and and they always look at me like I'm crazy because obviously it's Dodger Land here, but <laughs> I'm like, man, it's it, it's just different out there, and. Um, and being uh, having the opportunity to be a part of one, and, and 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 seeing the energy and feeling the energy. I mean, hopefully that's what the the guys feel tonight. And I know it's been a a little bit of a rough uh, start to the season, but I mean, it's like I like like I'm telling you, JD, it's it's a completely different uh, ball game when you step in, in in front of your fans and you finally get some cheering towards you instead of you know against you. Dude, 100%. Um, home, 100% this part. Home opener is one of my favorite days of year. I always make sure that I go to it because you're right, it is special here. Like, there, there is an atmosphere here. And I don't know if it's like summer is around the corner, right? And it's basically the first... Maybe it's like it's it's not just home opener for the Jays. It's like home opener for patio drinking. Where it's like, hey, exactly. everyone, we're all <laughs> about to drink outside again. And everybody in Toronto is like, nice. We're doing this. Open the roof. Like, yeah. how many people have the open the roof take when it's like six degrees in Toronto? Like, who cares? Open it up. Like, let it fly. Yeah. First patio night. But no, there's always an <laughs> awesome, awesome, awesome energy in the Rogers Center for the first game. The only thing that I'm kind of curious about this year, and the reason why I asked about like starting on the road and then coming home, is I kind like there is an added layer of pressure for these guys right now. Like they're they're coming back, and I've been talking about this, but you got to look up at the jumbotron, and it's only nine games, whatever, but. A bunch of your bats, especially, have to be go up, up, looking up at the jumbotron and seeing their statistics, and it's like OPSs of you know for Kirk, it's like three something, uh, three ninety two for Varsho, it's like four oh four. Even Vladdy, it's like six eighty nine. I, I don't like. I asked Brandon Belt this the other day. He's like, "Oh, you absolutely look up at that jumbotron." So I know it's a thing. It's probably not as impactful <laughs> as you know, uh, it, like once you settle into the actual plate appearance, but. Yeah, I'm going to be really curious to see how the players respond if they start slow tonight offensively and how the crowd reacts if that's the case. Yeah, I mean, it, it'll be interesting. And, and like I mentioned earlier, obviously it hasn't been the start that they wanted to no. to, to get off to, especially, you know, from, from the hitting side. But um, as tough as it looked, I'm sure as it is, I, I never had to look at my numbers hitting other than, mm-hmm. you know, when interleague was going on and you'd see zero, 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 yeah. and you still can't get a bit hit. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but for these guys, obviously they know, right. I mean, they know what's in front of them. They know they have you know 500 plus at bats left and, 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 and I don't want to get into the whole, like, Oh yeah. Like, you know, it's early in the season because uh, again, every game does matter. I mean, mm-hmm. we, we look at the end of the year and then you're like, Man, if only they would have won that one game in April. So, so they they all do matter. I mean, it, it is early and and also coming off a of, you know cold uh, New York City. I'm sure mm. that you know that's going to be you know now you get to play inside the dome. It's it's warm and and, and you get to kind of get a, get get a feel off the, off of the crowd. I mean that that that's the biggest thing I think when you're running out and and you feel the energy of the crowd when you when when the anthems you know when they sing the Oh Canada anthem mm-hmm. and 
because it's, it's, there's just something about it. And, and I think, uh, you know, you'd be crazy to think that that doesn't pump you up. So hopefully they come out with a different type of energy today. And it's not going to be an easy task. Obviously, mm-hmm. you have Seattle Mariners and Luis Castillo, and we all know what he – what he's done to the chase. Yes, we do. Uh, you know, <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so hopefully they're just able to come off with that, with, with, with a different type of energy and, and, and get hyped up. And I, I, like I said, I, I think they, those guys are pros and, and they've been in the league for, for a while now that they realize like, okay, uh, we've gotten off to a slow start, but it, it can easily be turned around with a really, really good series. And not, next thing you know, you're back to 280, 290 in, in, in just a blink of an eye. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned pitching in the cold. Now I kind of want to go backwards to the weekend for a second because you do have that experience. What 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 is it that makes it so difficult? Because like Gossman, I think the velocity on his fastball dropped by almost like four miles per hour. And my initial reaction was, oh, no, because he was coming off of an injury. Did they rush him back? And yeah, uh, there's been a rash of pitching injuries lately. I'm sure you've you know seen it. It's basically the discourse around all of baseball right now. But yeah, are you kind of dismissive of the Gosman start? Like it's easier to throw that one out because the cold. What is it that makes it so much harder to pitch? Uh, I always thought in um, uh, in one of the, the opening days that I had was in in Cleveland in 2012, mm-hmm. and I remember how cold it was. It was sunny, but it was still really really cold. And what makes it so hard is is to grip the ball. I mean, mm-hmm. the balls become so slick, and it's almost like. Um, at the time, <laughs> they weren't checking for for uh, for stuff in your hand. So yep. you know, for me, my go to was you know rosin and, and sunscreen, and you feel like you get a grip. But as soon as you get out there, it, it felt like your hand got slick again, I and mean, and you just felt like you lost all grip. I remember uh, my rookie year, we went to Cleveland too, and it was freezing cold. And and I'll never forget Roy Halladay. Um, he ended up pitching really well, but I remember after the start, he came up to me and he was like, "Man, like." that was like the toughest start ever just because I couldn't get a grip on anything. And his velocity was down too. Um, and I remember it was like 90, 91. And you're like kind of looking at the board and you're like, is this right? Like what's going on? And then we got back to Toronto and it was like, he was back to like 93, 94, 95 when he wanted to. And um, it, there's just something about it that it's just the fact that you have to keep blowing your hand, you get no grip on the ball. Everything becomes so slick when the wind's blowing in your face, it just feels it feels it feels different. I mean, sometimes you feel like you can't even feel your arm, and and I'm sure that's a little bit about uh, what, what Gosman was talking about, where it's just it just doesn't feel right. It doesn't. You can never really get warm or break a sweat. That's the biggest thing when you can't break a sweat and you mm-hmm. can't you know just get in rhythm and 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 hopefully you know like I said, hopefully it's nothing to worry about with with, with Gos. And I'm looking forward to watching his start uh, when he does get a start at the Rogers Center and 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 kind of and kind of see how he goes from there. One other thing from the weekend. Um, did you see yesterday's game? Uh, I watched a little bit. Yeah. Okay. You know who was behind home plate? <laughs> He's terrible, man. Yeah. I don't know how they're still giving him. Like, I, I just, you, you really do. You, you hold uh, big league baseball players to a high standard. Their organizations hold big league players to a very, very high standard to where if you don't perform, you're, you know, you're getting shipped out. And, and, the, and the fact that we keep running into these same problems and you kind of keep seeing the same guys make these crazy mistakes and, and, and and have an impact on on games. You just mm-hmm. kind of sit there and you're just like, what like what what are we doing? I mean, I get, you know, the umpires have they have a strong union, this and that. But where is the accountability? That's what I want to know, right? Yeah. I mean, we have to answer questions to the media. Like those guys should be answering. Like, what did you, Angel? What did you see on that pitch that Tim Mesa threw right down the middle? Yeah. How did you miss that? <laughs> yeah, middle middle ball like. And, and, and even, you know, and, and as much as I don't like the Yankees, I mean, even that Glaber Torres at bad where yeah. he punched them out, like it was just so yeah. weird and bizarre. And, 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 and it always, you know, it, it's him. It's, uh, I mean, I'll throw, you know, C.B. Buckner in there, who I think is one of the worst ever. And, and the fact that these, these guys just still keep getting ran out there and, and, and you just, I mean, <laughs> the world is seeing it now even more. And it's like they're under a microscope because now, Every time he is behind home plate, it's like, oh, crap, here we go again. Like yeah. any team that has him, you're just like, oh, man, like what, what kind of impact is this guy going to have on the game? Not what kind of impact is Vladimir Guerrero going to have in, in the game? Not what kind yeah. of impact is Aaron Judge? It's what kind of impact Angel Hernandez, and, that, and it shouldn't be like that. Dude, it's the craziest thing. I, I th- okay, so yesterday actually got me thinking, like, how bad would he have to be before Major League Baseball was like, okay, we need to stop this because he's so bad, right? Like he's so (laughs) bad at it and everybody knows it and there's groans across all of baseball and people are tweeting about it. It's like everybody knows enough is enough and yet it's just like, nope, they'll still trot him out there. Like 
if he started doing it like 50, 50, because it, the, one of my favorite things about Angel Hernandez, and I mean this in a funny way, cause I cannot stand him is like almost every like two strike count. It, somebody throws a ball. It's like even close to borderline. And he's just, you can tell he's itching to do the punch out. Like he's <laughs> itching and he's like, he kind of like twitches. He's like psyching out the rest of like fans are watching, like, Oh, is that it? What, what is this one? What's the, what's this call? He's obviously completely disconnected from reality because like, he's like, we have ways of actually looking at this stuff and analyzing this stuff. And we know he's the worst guy at it year over year. And then they're like, he's like, why didn't I get playoff games? He's like, was it cause you're bad? He's like, no, it's cause everyone's racist against me. I was like, Oh, that doesn't seem to actually compute in this situation. Angel. I don't, I don't think that that's the reason why you're being held back. It's because everyone thinks you're terrible. And he's like, no, I'm going to continue to just persevere through this and push through this. But yeah, it's, it's remarkable to me. Like it's remarkable that this is the position he's in. He's, and he's been doing this since the 2000s. So like you've had him behind the plate. Do you, do you have an Angel Hernandez oh, yeah. story? I don't. You know what, J.D.? I'll be honest with you. He was always pretty good when I was when Wow, I was the you're plate. like you were tight with him. You love him. You <laughs> guys are bros. I, and I was, no, there was no like connection there or anything like that. But the one yeah. thing I always, when I saw him behind the plate, I was like, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be about as respectful as I can be. So that, <laughs> so I don't get on that side, and 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 um, and I don't know if JP had that Cuban on Cuban connection and stuff yeah. like that, like yeah. you butter him up and stuff like that. I don't know, but I never really had like bad instances with him. Um, and 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 I'll be, honestly, I didn't really have bad bad things with with umpires in general. I mean, like I said, I always make sure I tip my hat and yeah. hey, let's go. Like, or if I had any questions, call them by their first name. There's all these little things that you kind of learn when you're in the big league set as a pitcher that you're like, okay, call him by his first name, go mm-hmm. up to him. Don't be disrespectful. So I always tried taking the high road, even when they, when, when they, when they miss a call or something like that, you're just kind of like, Hey man, like where, where, where'd you have that pitch? And he goes, Oh Rick, I had it about three inches off. All right, cool. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, you just kind of walk away and, and not make a big deal out of it. So, uh, but you know what? I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, it, it's still, it, this is big leagues, you yeah. know, and, 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 and you see, and you expect, um, you know, there, there's going to be little, you know, misses here and there, but when they're like pretty obvious, they're just like, man. And I don't know if you check out the, the, the umpire scorecards. Those are oh, always interesting. And I always look, look back and, and see, uh, and, and sometimes you're like, wow, he was 98%. Whoa. <laughs> you know, why can't he be that consistent every time? And, and it's just, it's just one of those things where, yeah, you would think that, that at one point major league baseball, would would make a change or I mean there's gotta be someone in triple A, right? Like you always say that about, yes, about there is. bigger guys who are struggling and you're like, there's gotta be someone in triple A that's gotta come up and take this job and, and then do a better job. So you just have to sit here and wonder like, is it because the seniority and, and all that and, and, and they just don't like making changes. He's a veteran, you're not gonna do that to him. So there's it's all crazy. these instances that you kinda sit there and, 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 and think about. Yeah, no, it's insane. Like it, it really is insane watching it. It's like, it, it's even, but all leagues are like this, right? There's, uh, you know, uh, you watch the NBA and it's like Scott Foster clearly yep. has a yep. beef with Chris Paul and like Scott Foster was best friends every day phone call with Tim Donahue during their tenures. And it's like, yeah, don't worry. He's fine. He didn't do anything. He's here. He'll be all right. It's like, yeah, no, <laughs> definitely. He's a hundred percent fine. Talk to Donahue on the phone every day, but no, it's just, it's no big deal whatsoever. Just uh, forget about it. Forget about it. Forget about it. Forget about it. He's totally a good referee. Like it's all sports. It's not just baseball, but yeah, you don't want to be the number one guy. You don't want to be at the top of the pile. And he is a hundred percent at the top of the pile for baseball. And I do think it's funny, like good for you that you're a mature enough guy and you, you played the gamesmanship and you know, you knew how to act, you know, you had the bedside manner with umpires. But I also think that's so crazy that you have to be that way in order to ensure them doing their job yeah. better. Like yeah. that an umpire is like, you better show me respect Ricky, because otherwise, you know, this, this strike zone is going to shrink. And you're like, cool. That's not, how I was supposed to be like, that's my least favorite thing is the officials that think they're the game, uh, that they're bigger yeah. than the game, that they're a part of it in some way. Like people should know their names. It's like, I don't want to know any ref's name ever. I don't want to know any umpire's name. That would be the ideal world. That would be my utopia. And I think that there's the guys <laughs> like Foster and man, who's the ref that Jeff Teague called out in the NBA the other day on his podcast. That was crazy. The story that he told, uh, yeah, Armin's probably got it, but it's like, you hear stuff like that and you're like, I can't believe that's real. I can't believe that Tony brothers. Yeah. Tony brothers story. 
If you haven't seen that, definitely go check that out, Ricky. It's crazy. He's talking about like the way that right. the ref speaking to him before the game. Um, and yeah, it was nuts. It's crazy. Yeah. Anyway. I mean, there, there was, there was a guy who, I mean, obviously uh, we all know his name, Joe West, you know, yeah. he had oh. to insert himself as the center crazy. of attraction in every single game. And Signed autographs. Kind of and yeah. And you just sit there and wonder, and you're just like, man, like stop making it about yourself. Oh. Like he was another, but when he was behind the plate, he was solid at his job. He just demanded. So like, he was like, I am the authority here type thing. And, you know, and, and but, but, but on the flip side, you had guys like Tim McClellan who were to me was one of the best, you know, he mm-hmm. was just great, solid, respectful. And, um, and, and, and yeah, so, I mean, you run into both sides of, of type of guys, uh, especially on the baseball field, but there's definitely guys that like to make it about themselves and, 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 and demand this certain respect. I just did it out of respect. Just, you know, they, they'd call me Ricky. I'd call them by their first name. Hey, mm-hmm. you know, how you doing, Rick? You know, whatever, whatever. And then you just kind of build a conversation from there. But, you know, you knew there was going to be uh, uh, mess ups every once in a while and stuff like that. But you know what? You just, again, take that. For me, it was like, just take the high road. Because when in crunch time, when, you, when you're when you on a three-two count and you miss by two inches, they, they'd probably give you that call. And I, and I agree with mm-hmm. you. I think strikes should be strikes. Balls should be balls. It shouldn't come down to, like, he respected me in the first inning, so I'm going to give him that call. <laughs> yeah, of course. But, but you know what? That's the, that's the way that some of these umpires operate, honestly. Yeah, I know, it's which is nuts. And also, listen, credit to you and your family and everybody that, you know, had a part in raising you because you obviously are just, like, a well-spoken good guy. Like, I've been around you a few times, and you clearly are that. Um, but, yeah, I also am jealous of guys like you where it's easy to like you, you know, like you're a likable guy, whereas I'm not. I'm not an easy like I, I'm a I'm a grow on you type of guy. I'm not like an immediately meets you and people are like, wow, you know who I really loved was that dude. It's like you like me once you know me for like three years. <laughs> you got to put up with three years of hating my guts. And then one day you might wake up and be like, he's not so bad. Uh, you know who else is likable? <laughs> the guy that's pitching tonight, uh, Jose Barrios, he gets the home and away which is a cool way for him to start the season, uh, the away opener and the home opener. Have you seen anything different from him this season, the way he's pitching? Because he's been lights out to start the season. Yeah, man. I mean, I think the biggest thing that you see is uh, uh, for him, it's always attacking the strike zone. And man, when his breaking ball is moving, it's like it starts in the strike zone and it just disappears into mm-hmm. the away, uh, until the others, uh, other side's batter's box when it comes to right, right-handed hitters. It's like they're on it, they're on it, and then boom, it just disappears. And I mean, Jose is a is a is a veteran now, right? I mean, he, I think he he's experienced, yeah, and we all remember, you know, a few years ago when all the hype was around him, and he came out that opening day, and and he struggled, and um, I think he learned a lot from that from that year, and then you know you move on to this past year and everything that happened in the playoff game, and and how emotional he was about that, and and I think he he just comes in with the chip on his shoulder, like I want to be the guy, I want to be that guy that that you know, that everyone is expecting me to be. And, and I think he, he's come out the first couple outings and, and shown that. And, um, you know, he's, a, he's from everything I've ever, I've always heard is that he's a big time leader in the clubhouse. He's a guy that works hard and he's a guy that's a master of his craft. And right now it's showing and, and hopefully he comes out this, uh, tonight and, and continues to, to ride that good wave that he's on. And it, it's always good. I mean, uh, I'll be honest with you, JD, when, when you're on a good wave and you're, and you're riding it and you're feel, you got a great feel for all your pitches. I think that's, that's, that's the biggest thing. And, and, and I think you see a confident Jose Barrios, you see a, you see a guy that, that, that's going out there and he's, he's saying, you know what, here you go. Here's my best stuff and, and hit it. And, and, and I think when, when, when you have that type of mentality, I mean, uh, you, you, you find success easily. Yeah. I can't wait to watch him pitch tonight. Like he's just, he's, he's completely, he's on a heater. Like he looks awesome. Um, and yeah, out of all the things that I'm most looking forward to uh, for this game, it's, it's that it's that I really do feel as though he's going to be able to limit Seattle's offense and yeah, give the blue Jays struggling offense a chance to be in this, this game. Okay. So I got to ask you about Alec Manoa. Nobody's watching him, but he just had his first single a rehab start. He threw 58 pitches, only 26 for strikes, four walks, six earned run over five hits uh, uh, over an inning and two thirds. The velocity was up, which is the thing that he is celebrating. My, my question is just this is like, what is the level now that you'll start to be concerned? Because yeah, I think it's a, yeah. First single a rehab start. You can't sound all the alarms. Uh, he didn't get a proper spring. They are going to build him up slow, but when, when are you going to say, Oh yeah, man, I, I don't know if the, I don't know if he's going to find it again. Oh man. <clears throat> you know, I, I think seeing that line and I'm sure everyone in Toronto saw it. Yeah. Um, it, it, it 
it it obviously it, it brings back <laughs> for me bad memories because I've yeah. been there and and I went through it and and you you want to look at the positives but at the same time it's sometimes it's tough man I mean I'm sure he's like you know yeah the velocity was there it's great but at the end of the day, I mean, this game is all about results, right? I mean, you you don't want to see walks, you don't want to see a guy that's 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 wild, and and uh, and I'm sure that's not what the organization wants to see. Wants to see. I mean, it's, it'd be different if you're like in the zone and you're, you know, sometimes in single light, you get whacked around because you are in the zone. You're a big mm-hmm. pitcher, and everyone wants to wants wants to hit off of you. And it's not like the big leagues where guys are you know patient and they kind of feel you out. It's they're free swingers. But when you see you know four walks, five walks, walks, whatever it is, and you see a lot of balls being thrown. You're just like, man, okay, like, um, how can we continue to fix this? And, and, and you mentioned, you know, he didn't have a normal spring. He's coming off a little shoulder injury. So you hope that they continue to build him up and he continues to, to feel good. And with the, the good, the, the great news is obviously the velocity is there. It's now being in the strike zone more consistently. And hopefully, you know, the next whatever outings they have planned for him, he, he continues to find that because, you know, man, like, you know, two years ago, he, he was the guy, right? I mean, mm. he was, it's like they were going to build the, the the rotation around him. So you just hope that, uh, that that he finds it, man. I mean, I know I'm sure it's been so long with last season and then obviously coming into the season, it's probably felt like 10 years for him. But like I always told him, you know, look at the, uh, at the light at the end of the tunnel. It's something that I failed to see as a player just because I, w- I got so caught up in the moment and, and wanting results right away. Just continue to see that light at the end of the tunnel. Continue to just work and 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 once it turns around, you're going to look back and and say, "Man, like I'm glad I went through those struggles." So you just you know you continue to root for him and and and, and hopefully he he figures something out. And the good thing is that now he's in Florida. He's he's you know he gets to build up at his at his pace and and then. And then the organization can go from there, but obviously there has to be some level of concern, right? I mean, yeah. when, when you're when you're when you when you're Ross, when you're Mark, I mean, there's there's got to be some level of concern. And you're just wondering, like, okay, like what's what's the next step? What, what what do we need to do with him? And and but again, I mean, hopefully, you know, if they have three or four starts planned for him, he he continues to build up and continues to show that, hey, you know what, I still have it. Yeah, dude, it's like the offense, right? It, if people were bringing up the fact that the Jays are, whatever, 25th in OPS uh, to start the year, uh, actually uh, 23rd in OPS to start the season, and we're, you know, nine games in, I'd be like, shut up, who cares? We'll, we'll, we'll talk about this in a couple months. But it's the fact that you have last season, right, that you're leaning back on and you're going, no, it's a larger sample. You can't discount it as much as you normally could have because of the way last year ended. And I feel the same way with Manoa's. He started spring, his first spring start. What was the problem? locating pitches he was walking guys he was hitting batters and he's mm-hmm. always hit batters but it's not you know that's that was when it was the the slider was getting mixed in as a like a wipeout pitch and he was dominating so now you look at stuff like this and you want to throw it away and i want to be like yeah whatever you know give him another start but as this continues to accrue it becomes more and more difficult and yeah you know you said the whole light at the end of the tunnel thing but this is my biggest point of curiosity for him psychologically is he's someone who's always dominated he's never had major step backs like this in his career but i have to imagine that when you work all you know you work all through the winter he's in the gym as much as he's in the gym he's thinking about trying to get back to his old self like how defeating it is when you first step out onto a mound and things aren't working for you very. I mean, like I said, I've I've been in that same situation. I mean, in 2011, I came off my best year, and I went into that spring, uh, to that season, you know, thinking like I had to work twice as hard to be that good. And I was like, I want to be that good. I want to be mm-hmm. 2011 good. So I got to work twice as hard. When in reality, sometimes it's like you have to take a step back. Yeah. And, and I think that's what that's what I failed to do. It's like take a step back, enjoy the success, enjoy what you just accomplished, and just kind of continue to go forward working on whatever it is that you need to work on without the pressure of like, I have to be better. I have to be better than I was. And, and I think when you fall into that trap, that's, that's when, you know, you start falling in you, when you do fail, you're like, man, like you start looking to your left, your right, and you don't know where to look and, and you kind of start feeling like you're, you're super lost. And, 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 and in seeing him and, and, and what happened last season, you kind of saw that you kind of saw a guy that was just lost. I just was like, I'm working so hard. Why is this game not rewarding me? And that's just the game of baseball sometimes. And that's just life, you know, mm-hmm. right? I mean, when, and, 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 and I think when you have a really good chance, I mean, for me, till the day I retired, it's when I kind of sat back and I was like, man, what I accomplished was really so cool. You know, like, like I got to the big leagues. 
uh, as an East LA kid. I, 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 I did so much in such so little time. Did I want 10 years in the big leagues? Heck yeah, I did. But the fact that I was able to get to the big leagues, you know, even if it was, you know, four plus years, it, it was like, I still did it. And, mm. and, and for me at the time, I got so caught up in like wanting to be the best and, and wanting to put out for my city and wanting to do this for, for my team. And that I forgot about like, you know what, enjoy the success, enjoy, you know, what we accomplished. But at the same time, you got to continue the same drive and, 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 and not try to overdo it. And I think sometimes in this game, you, you try and overdo things, you try and overthink things and, and that's where you kind of sometimes can go a little wrong. Dude, it was even at the beginning of this interview, you were like, I only pitched two uh, opening days. So I was like, yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> <Dude>. <laughs> You're like, oh, only two. I was like, yeah, as opposed to most people who are like, I got like four or five. <laughs> I was like, how many opening days? Like, yeah, I, don't I don't know. I can't really count them all. Uh, okay, last thing I want to ask you about, though, is, you know, speaking of overworking, right? Because... This is the topic in baseball right now. There's a quote going around from uh, Dr. James Andrews. I'm going to read it to you, and then, uh, you know, I, I want to just get a, a, a quick thought, which is, okay, I started following, this is him, quote, I started following the injury patterns and injury rates in the year 2000. Back in those days, I did about eight or nine Tommy Johns per year in high school age younger. The large majority of Tommy Johns were in the major league level. Uh, now, he's saying these kids are throwing 90 miles per hour in their junior year of high school. The ligament itself can't withstand that kind of force. We've l learned in our research lab that baseball is a development sport. The Tommy John ligament matures at around age 26, which is crazy to read. Uh, he didn't say that. That was me. Uh, they said in high school, uh, the red line where the forces beyond the tensile properties of the ligament is about 80 miles per hour, end quote. So in basketball, like I know you're a big hoops guy. There's a lot of discussion. There's like a bit of a reckoning now with the way uh, USA basketball specifically develops players. Um, there's a lot of discourse around AAU specifically and whether or not it's mm -hmm. actually teaching kids how to play the game the right way and why the United States is being surpassed by a lot of countries in terms of the top end talent. Uh, and yeah, just what it's sort of doing for kids, the wear and tear of kids. And do you think baseball is now having this reckoning moment? Because a lot of guys are talking about the, the chase for velocity and you read something like that from literally the world's foremost expert. And it's, it's very hard to ignore. The problem is, is how do you put the genie back in the bottle? Because kids and parents and teams and, uh, strength coaches are, are always going to be chasing that velo now. Like, I, I don't know where we go from here. Yeah, no. And, and it, uh, I'm glad you brought this topic up because I was just talking to uh, to a couple friends about it, and they were asking me the same thing. And and, it, and it's true; it's become a. It, it, the thing is that we have created this thing where we've become obsessed with velocity, and and so the only way to get to college is you know who throws hard and how do you get it, how do you become a prospect? You got to throw hard. But now we're seeing that those guys that throw hard they last you know two three four max years and then boom they go in for surgery and you're just kind of seeing this epidemic but i think it starts at the youth level i mean you mentioned aau basketball and and the the the, the flaws that that exist there it's becoming baseball too man i mean i get asked by you know uh, i coach both my boys now in baseball and the amount of times i get asked to give pitching lessons to eight and nine year olds i'm like for what <laughs> Like, you know, like they have the attention span of, you know, of, of an eight-year-old. You know, they, they really don't process things the way a 14-year-old kid would or anything like that. I mean, with travel ball and, and it, it becomes, especially here in Southern California, it's a year-round sport and we're going to do this and we're winning rings here at the age of eight, nine years old for what? They I, they asked me about my son. They're like, hey, can can we borrow him for, for travel ball? No, thank you. Like, I'm good. Like, he's good just playing the little the little league that we have right right down the street from our house um and and then he moves on to soccer and then he moves on to basketball and it's just uh the way i, I run practice practices the, the kids always like they're always like puffing and puffing because they're like again we're doing this again i'm like fundamentals like if we don't know how to mm -hmm. feel the ground ball we don't know how to play the game of baseball if we don't know how to play catch we don't know how to play the game of baseball so they kind of buy into that and, and i think we've created this epidemic where where it's like uh, if you're not in travel ball, you're not good enough. If you're not, you know, if you're not throwing a hundred, you're not good enough. And it's like, when I was coming up, I mean, um, and, and, and I don't feel that old, JD, but, mm -hmm. uh, when I was coming up, it was like, um, you know, 86, 87, you, you, you were solid there and you just kind of build up as you went along. I mean, coming out of high school, I was maybe tops 88. And, and by the time I left college, I was tops maybe 94. Mm -hmm. And now I feel like that's considered not no bueno, you know, and, and I think we've created this thing where 
if you don't throw hard, you're not going to get a scholarship. If you don't throw hard, you're not going to get drafted. So um, I think this is this is a big baseball problem that we have, and obviously with proper mechanics too. I mean, I, I, I could get into into all of it, but it would it would take forever. But this, this is just the way that, that the mechanics. You see some certain guys mechanically, and you're like, whoa! Like you can see the flaws that that exist there. So um, <clears throat> so yeah, I mean, it's it's a combination of everything and uh, of a lot of things going on in the game of baseball, and and, and hopefully, you know. It, it, it's it's sad, right? I mean, when, when you look at you know Strider and, and Shane Beaver, and you're just like, it's like you're almost reading social media, and you're like, who's next? Mm-hmm. You know, who's 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 going to be next, and, and what big star is going to be next? And um and and and, and it stinks. And and hopefully we're able to find you know the answer to it. I don't know if we ever will, but uh, the more we become obsessed with velocity, the more we become obsessed with you know throw as hard as you can and we don't really care about your mechanics we'll squeeze the two three years out of you and then it's max because that's what it is and mm-hmm. the minors you you go down there and i've talked to a few guys and they're like yeah everyone throws 100 everyone everyone throws 95 plus everyone it's just you know it's max we'll squeeze two three years out of you but to me i'm like i'm looking at what happened to longevity like what happened to the guys that could pitch for eight nine ten years in the big leagues and, and i feel like that's slowly uh decreasing yeah, dude, honestly, I, I think that it's across all sports, especially, well, three of them in particular, which is basketball, baseball, and hockey. For me right now, the ones that I see directly, because like football, we just don't have in this country the same way and still feels to me anyways, mm-hmm. like football is, um, it's just, it's a sport where you have to play and practice hard and you still, you have to compete. Like it, it's just a hard thing to, you know, uh, develop skills, right? Like you can be faster. Like there's always going to be guys that if you run four four speed, that that's going to get you noticed. But also a lot of that is like, you know, there's no really bad ways or too many bad ways of overtraining when it comes to like sprint speed. At least we're not seeing a ton of injuries based off that. Um, the other sports, it feels like baseball, like the velocity, basketball with like the three-point shooting and the, the dribbling and hockey, same thing is that there's such an emphasis on skill, 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 a certain skill. And then we're losing some of the other stuff that, that kids are being professionalized way too early. And I talk about this all the time where, you know, I, I like that a guy like you looks at it and goes, yeah, my boys are going to play other sports. You meet so many pro athletes and like, what's the best way They're like play a lot of sports, enjoy the sports, have fun with the sports, make it something that you covet and enjoy rather than what you see so much of now, which is like, oh, your kid's eight and they're, you're coming up to Ricky Romero and asking for like pitching tips and you're trying to get him <laughs> to like get his velo ups. Like, shut up, just let your kid play a sport. He's eight. Like this yeah. is crazy. And so I feel like a lot of the joy is being taken out of sports and this hyper focus on skill. We're losing a lot of what makes these games special. And we're actually putting kids in more harm than they've been in, in, in years past. And I, I just don't like the trend. The only hope that I have is that people seem to be opening up their eyes to this across all the major sports. And a lot of the experienced people are saying, Hey, something's got to change here. And that's why I think it's really important for a lot of people like yourself and a lot of pro athletes to stay engaged in this and continue to use your platforms to say, yo, we've, we've got to do this thing differently because otherwise you're going to hand it over to people who haven't done it and who people who think that they have some formula, right? The strength, the, I'm not saying strength and conditioning coaches like that, but you know, I'm talking about like the Instagram strength coaches, the Instagram yeah. people <clears throat> that claim that they have some solution to something or a skill that they have. And it's like, what did you actually do though? And it's like nothing. You're just, yeah, this is about you, not the game. And so, yeah, good yeah. for you for doing it that way. But yeah, I'm, I'm scared and yet like weirdly hopeful. Yeah, no, I really like the word you use right there, professionalism. I think we're trying to professionalize these kids at the age of eight and nine. And I'm like, so you dumb. guys realize they're not going to be big leaguers yeah. uh, at 10, 11, 12, 13. Dude, I like told my dad yes, when yes. I was like 10 years old, I wanted to be a professional <laughs> basketball player in a pizza hut. And he literally laughed so hard in my face. And I was like, I'll show you. And guess what? I didn't make the NBA. So he was smart. He's new. He's like, what are we talking about? He's like, just enjoy playing the games. You're a kid. <laughs> I was like, that's, I'm going to be a guy. That's pretty, and that's pretty much what it is. And the reason I got into coaching, I always said I want to be that coach or that parent that kind of sits back in the outfield away from parents, mm-hmm. you know, maybe with the, with the adult beverage in my hand and yeah. just kind of enjoy. And then I went to one practice that I let my son play on a different team. And I was like, oh, hell no. Yeah. <laughs> I, got, I got to put on the uniform again. Let's go. Yeah, and, but that's and, the and, thing. And Only that's... guys like you seem to be able to like really pick this up because you did it, right? You know, like I exactly. think that a lot of parents have a tough time, especially if they're new to sports. They're like, oh, I guess that's normal. And it's like, no, <laughs> like that's yeah. not the way yeah. it's supposed to be. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I, it is, and it's, yeah, and it's teaching them, like I said, the fundamentals of the game, just mm-hmm. the repetition, the repetition. I'm like, you guys, 
you guys ever heard of spring training? They're like, yeah. I was like, you know what we do in spring training? The same thing every single day. Mm -hmm. Every single day. When you guys go to a big league ball game, what do you guys see the infielders doing during batting practice? Taking ground balls. Exactly. They take a million ground balls throughout the whole year. So that's what it is. That's how we're going to practice, and that's what we're going to learn. And sure enough, they start buying in, and they start seeing the results on the field in a game, and they start getting excited about it. And I'm like, you see, if we get out, we hit. If we don't get out, we don't hit. And and then they kind of get a kick out of that. But it, it, it's, it's a fun process. It's fun watching them grow up. I mean, again, they're eight, seven, eight-year-olds. So one of the teams I have, and then I have a little – you know, five and six year old team, which, you know, that's at that, that age. It's just like, just go out there and, <laughs> and run the base slices. however the hell you like, want yeah, to run them. It's, like, yeah, it's, a, or it's basically <laughs> just a meeting of kids to eat oranges and drink uh, sports exactly. drinks, yeah, which exactly. is what it should be. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Are you playing baseball? Like, no, we're eating oranges and I guess there's baseball. <laughs> I yeah. guess we'll do that yeah. later. Yeah. And you, and you, we'll and you just try to keep them engaged, right? Yeah. To, to like the game and, and hopefully when they get that's to it. the next level, which is the next division, you're just like, okay, they, they liked it enough that they came back and, and you still teach a little bit of fundamentals, but not, not, you can't go too crazy. And, mm -hmm. uh, but, but yeah, man, it, everything about it has been fun. I mean, obviously um, getting to do this, you know, a lot of people ask me like, how does it feel like, you know, f to go from like a big league stadium to come and coach a bunch of seven year old te teams. And I was like, you know what, our uh, 78 year old uh, baseball team. And I'm like, you know what? I always dreamed of this when I had, before I had kids, I was like, I always wanted to have my kid running around, you know, the Rogers Center the way I pictured it. But obviously, mm -hmm. I was young, and, and there's no chance in hell that I uh, sh uh, should have kids at that age that I was, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, in Toronto. Uh, but um, but now, you know, seeing it all and, and, and being able to experience you know, even our walks just down to the to the Little League field, it, it, it's special. And it's something that, you know, I hope my kids, one day they're like, I remember when dad used to, you know, walk with me to the field and we used to just talk about baseball or whatever it is. And, and, and I think they're, they're, the, the, my uh, eight-year-old's getting to that point where he's kind of starting to realize like, okay, this is, this is fun. This is, this is what it, this, I'm enjoying this and I'm enjoying being with my friends. And at the end of the day, that's kind of what I want, right? I mean, you want them to like it and, and the rest can take care for itself. I really don't care if he's the best eight-year-old in the country or a nine-year-old in the country. That to me doesn't mean anything. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that, I think that's where we're at right now, where parents get caught up in rankings. You, you see rankings of 10-year-olds and nine-year-olds, and you're mm -hmm. just like, what are we doing? What are we doing? Dude, honestly, most of the time when I see the regular, like a lot of the parents were that are doing that kind of stuff, and I know people in my life that are like that, where they're like, and then the kids got this hockey, and it's like, you know, tens of thousands of dollars a year. And I'm like, this doesn't seem like it's for them. It seems like it's for you, but whatever. I'm just going to stay out of it. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Yeah. like I always exactly. go, I don't want to think I, I don't have kids. I'm like, I just have kids is a nightmare. I talk to guys like you and I'm like, man, maybe I want to have kids. <laughs> I'm like that sounds cool. What you got going on. That sounds all right. Walks down kids, to the man. beach it's... and just having a beer and watching your kid and just checking out like on the, yeah, just having fun with it. Like that sounds good. And having that perspective, that sounds nice. The other stuff, the pressing, I'm like, I don't want any involvement with this. <laughs> like I don't want to, <laughs> uh, nothing to do with that. I'm good. Thanks. I like sleeping in. It's nice. <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. Hey, Ricky, uh, thanks so much for doing this, man. It's always a treat getting to chat with you and uh, yeah, enjoy the, the home opener tonight, pal. You too, man. I mean, shoot, I'm, I'm looking forward to, I mean, I'll see it on TV, but yeah. uh, I can't wait to see all those, those rhinos. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of buzz and talk about them. I already, I'm already seeing it on Twitter. So yeah. Or X as they call it. So no, don't looking do that. forward to it. And you're old. And, and, uh, <laughs> um, looking forward to, uh, to, to, to hopefully the Jays getting back on track. Absolutely, brother. Talk to you soon. See you, Ricky. Uh, All right. right sounds good.